I'm gonna have to remember things about this very forgettable book. It might still be iced coffee season, but my makeup has fully transitioned to fall colors and I'm not mad about it. Hello folks, welcome back to my channel. You can call me Lolly. In this video, I was about to say in this book, nope, in this video, uh, I will be discussing all the books I read in the month of August. I finished seven books. Okay, the first book I finished was definitely one of the favorite reads of the month. This is The Fay Keeper by H.E. Edgemond. This is the sequel to The Witch King, um, but this was one of my, my um, highly anticipated books of the year. It did not disappoint. I possibly love this even more than book one, but like, I'm thinking of like the time period, like what was happening in my life around the time that I read The Witch King. I'm like, oh man, I really got to reread it because I think I was like fresh back to work. So I was reading in like 15 minute increments on my breaks which is a vi which is very very different experience than being able to sit down and read for like a, ch a full like hour at a time so i like i loved book two possibly more than book one but the comparison just makes me want to reread book one so what's the premise the premise is to save a fey kingdom a trans witch must face his traumatic past and the royal fiance he left behind accurate Wyatt. Wyatt is his name. So Wyatt is, so there is like the human mortal normal world and then like the fey kingdom. And in the fey kingdom you have the fey who are the ruling class and then the witches and they're kind of like an oppressed subservient class. And the big drama of this romance couple is, they, I don't remember exactly what it is, but they kind of have like an emotional, they kind of like have an emotional bond that like pinpoints who their mate should be and I think in the first book it said like this is like who your who's your like ideal for reproduction we learn in book two it's a lot more complicated than that a big fuck you to conquerors rewriting history it's great um so the heir to the throne I'm explaining this very badly I'm sorry <laughs> I'm sorry um this book is these books are full of so much angsty sass and I love it and but it's kind of coming through in like how the mood I'm in as I review them so there's a big scandal because the heir to the throne this fairy has you know bonded with a witch as his fated mate um and this witch um things happen and he uh and he uh, runs away from Fairy, partially to get the fuck out of this arranged marriage and also because they, in coming into their power, bad things happen. Um, I really love that when his former fiance shows up hunting him down for, to bring him back for something, he just kind of like looks, looks at Wyatt and he's just like, name, pronouns, Wyatt, he, him, okay, great. like. Like, Wyatt being trans is not a point of friction, um, at least with um, the love interest. I, again, this is where I like I need, re really need to reread book one because I just I don't remember it being one of the tense parts of the book. But there's like there is so much, <laughs> so much in this book. So Wyatt has to go back to the Fey Kingdom to work some things out. Um, and in book one, they. Uh, end up stopping this coup that was going to overthrow the royal family. Part of like the fairy world lives adjacent to planet Earth, the human world, because they had to leave their original home. Something happened there that we learn more about in book two. Um, so at the end of book one, part of like the cliffhanger is, oh, by the way, the gate to fairy has been opened. So we open book two with they're dealing with the aftermath of this coup they're trying to rebuild a society where the witches are not so oppressed but there's just a lot of bad blood between the fairies and the witches um it really echoes a lot of like the the struggles of like activism today of like we know that what we have isn't working we fucking need to burn it down but like but building 
but how do you build something new when most people don't have the imagination to see any other way and aren't willing to forgive and give grace and extend hands across the table before they see a new thing that's working. Um, so that there's an interesting conversation of the tension in that there. Um, I fucking loved book two because because a big thing with the series is Wyatt is a fucking angry asshole. He's a dick. <laughs> Um, he has so much anger and like what's, uh, Perpetual Pages, I, Audrey at Perpetual Pages has an amazing review of this book and an interview with the author. Um, I'm gonna link those videos down below because they convinced me to read the series and did not disappoint. Um, but there's a lot in there about like trans rage, queer rage, like the rage of, you know, marginalized people and just like how validating it is to re to have a character who is just like angry and fed up and doesn't fucking give a shit about like respectability politics and all that shit so why would they play by those rules because at the end of the day it doesn't make them any more safe um so they might as well be authentic and like not pretend to be fine when they're not so book two why it has kind of come around and been like while i have many reasons to be mistrustful and angry and fed up Maybe I don't need to be a big asshole all the time because that's the trauma talking and part of healing is like not letting, you know, the trauma reaction guide everything. So I, I think I really like this book because it there's a lot of like kind of therapy by proxy, a lot of like, Ugh, I hate having to like forgive and be patient for this person, but I know it's the right thing to do. So say it with me. I'm sorry. And I, I enjoy it because you see, you see that there's a, you see the process of like, you kind of need to fake it till you make it. And that's not always a bad thing. Um, especially when you're trying to like heal from traumatic shit and become a better person, a bigger person, you know, not just repeat the trauma that was inflicted on you. Yeah, um, I think something I struggled with in the first book, but I think I just like rolled, was I was familiar and I just rolled with it, is the language in this is very modern. It's very internet speak lingo. <laughs> I sound like an old fogey. And in the first book, I think it kind of annoyed me. Annoyed wasn't the right word because it's like, but this is the language of the age of these characters. They're like 17, 18 in these books so it's kind of appropriate that they talk like this but it 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 took some adjusting but by book two i'm fucking on board i've talked enough either you're interested in this book or you're not um it's great i need to get myself some physical copies so i can reread them um if they if you if they've been on your radar um <laughs> they're great um I am terrible at remembering to like give trigger warnings and stuff so but i know that like Audrey is very good at like listing out trigger warnings so in that like review video I'm gonna link like they will if you had any concerns about like what is mentioned and what's on page like I'm I'm pretty sure Audrey has got you covered they're great uh the next book I DNF'd at 82 pages because I wasn't loving it and then I got to this passage and I was like fuck you I'm done um so this is <laughs> Under the Black Flag, The Romance and the Reality of Life Among the Pirates by David Cordingly. This is off of my Amnesia Reads TBR, which is um, a project. I will link that TBR playlist. I am, I am so close to finishing that TBR, and I am so ready to have a new pile of books. So that is a project where I take books that I already own, that I know I've read, but it's been years since I've read them, or I otherwise, like, I don't remember anything about them. Or it's been long enough that, like, I really need to read that through an adult lens. So this was a book I actually, because the print is so freaking tiny, this is one of the books that I, I picked up an audiobook from Libro FM of this book. Because my library doesn't have an audiobook of this. So this is a very comprehensive history of pirates, specifically the romance and the reality. I do think like this tagline is very accurate um, 
from from the introduction to the book the uh, the author talks about like you know we have these romanticized ideas we have these stereotypes of pirates and he, and he spends the book exploring where do those ideas come from are they based in reality are they based in fiction like where do those ideas come from and giving historical background um uh there were two things that really really bothered me first was um the way this author portrays information is very disorganized at least for me like especially it starts in the introduction and it just continues like he'll talk about a character and then suddenly he's talking about like a, fi a work of fiction and then he's talking about like the author of a different book of fiction and then he's talking about like um something that was common in this time period and then he's talking about like the difference between buccaneers and privateers and this is like all in the same this this is all within like four pages he just jumps around from topic to topic and i can't follow the thread of how he leads from one thing to the other i'm sure it's there but maybe part of it is because i was listening on audio i'm not giving a hundred percent attention to every single sentence but but my brain doesn't do that. <laughs> and if you are jumping around that fast, that's not a writing style that I gel with. It doesn't work for me. And, you know, in terms of whether or not I want to keep this, it's like, I can't keep, like, this doesn't serve the purpose of a reference book. Because if I remember reading about a certain fact, I don't know what chapter it's in. Like, yes, you have chapter titles of, like, women pirates, treasure, storms, but you talk about such a broad category of things that that particular detail could be anywhere in this book. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Um, it didn't work for me. Um, the other thing that really bothered me, and this is like the paragraph that did it in for me. Um, let's see, he's talking about Blackbeard. And, you know, I don't think you really need context. This is more about the language. The casualties might have been higher because Blackbeard had instructed one of the blacks in his crew to set light to the gunpowder store and blow up the pirate ship if the lieutenant and his men boarded the vessel. Fortunately, two men from a traveling from a trading sloop who had been drinking with Blackbeard the previous night were hiding below during the fight and they prevented the black from carrying out his orders. The men. The black. And this is kind of like not the first time that this kind of racially careless language is present in this author's writing. So what do I mean by that? It's like he doesn't use really blatant slurs unless he is um, having a direct quote from a document. Okay, but like this paragraph, it's not a quote this is the author explaining something and he's he, and he's making a designation between men and the black crew member and it's like really is it really that hard for you to say the black man or the black crew member um it's there's just something about it that like really really stood out to me that you know, I'm sure the author is like basically just like reading this kind of language in his research and not thinking about it doesn't bother him. And then that kind of language just creeps into his own writing and he is not prompted at all to think critically about whether he needs to use that same historical language when he's writing in his own voice. Um, let's see, when was this book published? 1995. More, like more than 20 years ago now but still like it just it didn't sit well with me and I think like it's like an example of like this is a thing that I don't really like about some historical nonfiction. It leads into like a more complicated thing that I didn't like in this book especially when he was talking about like how the pirates viewed slaves and the hopefully I remember to circle back into like how what he talked about with like homosexuality and pirates but let me finish this point and then I'll go back to the example or I'll forget and I'll edit out this sentence it's great <laughs> editing is great <laughs> but um I don't like non-fiction like history non-fiction that doesn't draw conclusions 
that doesn't make a case for something. And I know there's like this, there's probably a, a style of nonfiction that's like trying to be unbiased in, like I, I saw, I felt this a lot in the book um, White Trash by Nancy Eisenberg. Like it had such a promising premise, but it just was like a three star read for me because I felt like these, these authors, they're just presenting their research in a single reference volume but they're not drawing conclusions. They're not telling you like, why is this significant? They're not really like making the case for something or against something. And maybe you're trying to be neutral, but what actually I think happens is, how do I explain this? Like particularly in Under the Black Flag with like that, that language is, with like the language that I had a problem with is like, be wary of reinforcing the history that's written by the victors because like we know this we know that like you know this this is true of history like from the beginning of human time that the stories that survive the version of events that survive is told by the people who survive and the people who remain in power um and i feel like this kind of like desire to remain um unbiased it means that the author is not questioning what's missing from their research, whose voices are not being told, whose voices are not represented and why, and what might, if their voices could be found, how might they tip the narrative? Um, so I think another, okay, so now I'm going to circle back to an issue I had when he was talking about homosexuality among the pirates. Um, he go, he makes his case, presents all this evidence that like homosexuality among pirates was not any more prevalent than it was among the general population. It's funny because I was reading this at the same time that I was watching our flag mean stuff. So I had just finished reading about um, Blackbeard and um, the, the fop pirate captain and being like, oh, oh, that's, that's a documented thing. Those are real people. Both of them are real people. Oh, that's funny. Interesting. <laughs> anyway, our flag means death is lovely. It takes a little while to get going, but like, it's lovely. <laughs> he like makes the case that, you know, there's no evidence that homosexual relationships of like a romantic or merely functional version were any more common among pirate ships than they were among the general population as evidence, you know, and he kind of uses national navies as the comparison. He's like, you know, we, we don't have a lot of documentation from the pirate ship, we don't have as much documentation of whatever from pirate ships as we do from navies, but in navies, we, you know, if we look at letters people wrote, diaries, um, documents of um, court martials or whatever, we just don't have as much, you know, based on that, we can see how often um, homosexuality pops up among um, navy crews and from that can deduce that the numbers must be similar for pirates. Ah, but he says in the Navy, or it's like, but he actually says, like, this is where, like, you need to, like, draw some, con you need to not be afraid to draw conclusions. Like, dude, pay the fuck attention to the thing that you are saying yourself. Among pirates, homosexuality was not explicitly forbidden in the rules of conduct. But in the Navy, it could be punishable by death. Sir, and you don't think that that maybe had an impact on how often something happened in order to be recorded? You don't think that had any impact on whether people felt free or safe to pursue this non-heteronormative relationship? Like, who are you to make me read all these names and dates and facts and shit and have me feel that I'm smarter than you? It's like, I, wa I want to be learning stuff from the people who are smarter than me. I don't want to be 
feeling like I need to take you to school. So I DNF'd it. I think this book would be good for somebody who is actively deep dive researching pirates because he does reference lots of documents. He references movies and novels and in, in like in the place where he's talking about homosexual relationships, he references um, a pretty cr comprehensive book that makes that did specific research specifically on that topic. So I feel like as a jumping off point for further research, I do think it has a purpose there. But as like just a casual nonfiction reader who's just wanting to learn a little bit more about a topic, not for me. Nope. Nope. <laughs> if you have recommendations of other pirate nonfiction that my, I might be more well suited to me, I would love, please leave it in the description box, please. Please. Okay, the next one was a lovely surprise. So this is Fantasmas, um, which is a Spanish translation of Ghosts by Raina Telgemeier. Telgemeier. I will, oh, I should say all of the books that I talk about, I will have the authors, the translators, and the narrators where applicable listed in the description box below, just in case I mispronounce something or forget to say, or you just want to reference it. So um, I have a goal of trying to read at least four books a year in Spanish. Like I, I don't say I'm fluent, I say I'm proficient and part of keeping up with that is at least doing like some reading or listening to an audiobook in Spanish. Um, and I found this in a, a small used bookstore and thought, ah, yes, young adult graphic novel, perfect, perfect. That's like exactly what I should be reading. Um, so this follows a story of these two sisters. Um, what are their names? Katrina is the oldest sister and her younger sister, Maya. They move to this very foggy, cold, windy, Northern California small town because supposedly the weather is going to be better for her sister who is sick with cystic fibrosis, which um, one of the symptoms of that is it um, affects her lung function. Her lungs fill with fluid and, and it causes problems. Um, so they move there, of course, like the older sister, I think she must be like a high school freshman or something. Um, she's sad about leaving all her friends and moving to this new town that's like small and super boring. Typical moving to a new town against the children's will kind of setup. They make friends with a young boy there who like tells them that like, yeah, the town has ghosts and we throw a Dia de los Muertos festival every year so that they can come visit with us and like ghosts are real. Of course, Katrina is very skeptical, but lo and behold, it turns out to be real. Um, and, um, but, and somewhere in there things happen, like her sister's health worsens and like th the story of them dealing with the ghost parallels Katrina's anxieties of the reality that her sister is sick and could die and could die young um, and the way that like she is an older sister is kind of like annoyed and sometimes mean and unfair to her sister and then like her sister gets her health worsens and she feels and Katrina feels worse and like that tension of like there's an element of their normal sibling childhood that has been robbed from them because of her younger sister's illness and like the unique grief and guilt that Katrina is feeling because of that. Um, so the stories with the with their relationship with the ghosts is kind of like a vessel for Katrina to deal with that. Um, and it was made me cry a little bit and just was like so heartfelt. It was so lovely, you know, and they've got a great time um, showing the uh, Dia de los Muertos Halloween silhouette. Uh, the Dia de los Muertos celebration. And you know what? I'm pretty sure the author is not Latine. Latin? Latine? This is how you talk about a culture that you may not be from. Because the author, like in her, her afterwards, she talks about that, like, the witnessing the town have the Dia de, the, the Dia de los Muertos celebration um, is mirroring her own experience of moving to a town and witnessing that celebration. It's like, yes, that culture is represented, but it's also portrayed with the understanding that the perspective is from somebody outside of it. Like, it's not just the author is outside this culture, but the character learning about it is outside this culture. So 
it's appropriate that things are being explained and some things are being oversimplified and some things maybe aren't explained because they're not really necessary for you to understand the overarching theme of it. Um, it really worked. I really liked it. I was reading this and I'm like, man, I should see if like the other graphic novels from this author have been translated in Spanish. I would love to pick up more of them. And spoiler alert, uh, I found another one in Spanish from a completely different thrift store. Someone in that thrift, I can't wait to film that book haul. That was exciting. Someone in my neighborhood has donated a bunch of young adult novels <laughs> in Spanish to this thrift store and I was so excited. Absolutely happy to bend my book buying budget rules for that find. Anyway, that's, we'll talk about that more when I film my, um, my next book haul. Like I, I thought, like I, I picked this up just because I thought it would be like, um, appropriate reading level for my Spanish, but actually this was like the, absolutely one of the hits of books that I read this month. So I love that for me. <laughs> the next book I read was The Spanish Daughter by Lorena Hughes. Let me read you this premise. As a child in Spain, Puri always knew her passion for chocolate was inherited from her father, but it's not until his death that she learns of something else she's inherited, a cocoa estate in Vinces, Ecuador, a town nicknamed Paris Chiquito. Eager, eager to claim her birthright and filled with hope for a new life after the devastation of World War I, she and her husband Cristobal, Cristobal set out across the Atlantic Ocean, but it soon has become clear someone else is angered by Puri's claim to the estate. When a merc mercenary sent to murder her aboard the ship accidentally kills Cristobal, instead, Puri dons, dons her husband's clothes and assumes his identity, hoping to stay safe while she searches for the truth of her father's legacy in Ecuador. Though freed from the rules that women are expected to follow, Puri confronts other challenges to the estate, newfound siblings, hidden affairs, and her father's dark secrets. Then there are the dangers awakened by her attraction to an enigmatic man as she tries to learn the identity of an enemy who is still at large, threatening the future she is determined to claim. So that premise, like, that premise has, like, everything I want in a historical fiction. I, I almost bought a physical copy of this book so many times, and I'm so glad I didn't because it was so mediocre. You know, and you know what, I'm almost glad it's forgettable so that I can periodically be freed of the disappointment of how disappointing that book was. So, what are my issues with it? Um, so first off, I was excited about, you know, this woman dressing up as a man and, like, being freed from the constraints of being a woman. I'm gonna have to remember things about this very forgettable book. So, like, yeah, she's dressed as a man, and initially, like, she has some analysis about, like, oh, I don't have to worry so much about being rude, because apparently men don't worry about that. I can actually sit down and enjoy my meal because I don't have to worry about serving the men. Um, I can just tell someone to carry my bags because giving orders is a thing that men do. And like there's the potential for her to like be critical of the expectations for women, but like it, it, it's like she starts to do that and then it like doesn't really go anywhere. It's mostly she just like notices the contrast, but like it doesn't like magically make her a suffragette or something drastic like that where she's like, oh my god, this is bull- I've been living a bullshit life. What? Like, fuck this. Now that I've had freedom, fuck this. No. It doesn't go anywhere with that. Yeah, and then there's like the mystery of her trying to figure out who's after her, what's going on, and that just felt super lackluster. Um, I didn't really enjoy the writing. I realized afterwards, oh, I don't think I, I noted this. This, I think this book is actually translated from the Spanish. So I really didn't gel with the writing. Wait, no, it's not. It's not translated from Spanish. The author is a native Spanish speaker and this is like one of her first books written in English. So she is writing with English as a second language. I bring that up because, like, I didn't really enjoy the writing style. I just felt like there wasn't 
a lot of life or embellishment or style to it. That might be because it's not the author's native language, so I, I don't want to be overcritical of that, but also, honestly, like, the writing didn't... The writing style, the writing voice didn't really capture me either. But, like I said, like, I want to I wanna leave room for saying that that... It, it might have been because she's not writing in her native language, and I don't know, maybe that is something that will get better as she writes more books. Here's hoping. So that description talks about, like, she's starting to, like, have feelings for this enigmatic man, and I did not like the romance. I felt like... For, for her for her being in such a precarious situation, even though this man, like, learns that she is, like, a woman in disguise, even with that, like, she doesn't, still doesn't have, like, enough reasons to trust him. She doesn't have, she doesn't have enough safety to, like, let her guard down. Like, she doesn't know enough about him to trust him. So, like, I really didn't buy it. It made me uncomfortable. Um, and then we learned some more things about him where it's like, okay, he's not necessarily the bad guy, but, like... Ugh. You had this mystery element, you had this historical element, you had this historical element that like didn't feel very strong, you have like the woman disguised as a man and being freed from the constraints of being a woman that like wasn't very strong. There's just like so much potential that went nowhere. There is one thing that I liked, I kind of hesitant to say I liked it because the bar is so low for not fucking this up, but this book didn't fuck it up, so I gotta mention it. Um, there, I need to be kind of vague because it's kind of a reveal, but anyway. There was a moment where our main character discovers that somebody's husband is queer. And when she confronts that initial person... The other person is like, uh-huh. And or I think it's like somebody is telling Puri that this person's husband is queer. And Puri's like, oh, I see. And like doesn't really react. And the other person's like, did you already know? And she's like, no, I'm just from Europe. And it's, it's more common there. Um, and then like when we actually learned about their relationship, we also know that like that's not that's not a secret between the couple. Um, so I was worried that this was going to be like a dramatic, like, well, the reason you're unhappy in your marriage is because your spouse is queer. Surprise, shock. And it didn't. Like, people, people knew and people were okay with it. And I feel like in historical fiction that hasn't happened very often. It's like queerness is usually used as this big shocking life ruining reveal and that didn't happen in this one. And so that's one aspect where I, I don't know if it was handled amazingly well, but it avoided a bad trope. The, the bar is at least, can you avoid the bad trope? It did that. Okay, great. This is, this is like a book you pick up in the airport bookstore and when you finish reading it, you feel totally content to leave it in the hostel that you're staying and not carry it with you for the rest of the trip. Okay, the next book was also kind of disappointing. This is a ebook I got from NetGalley. It's t kind of an arc. I mean, NetGalley's supposed to be arcs, but it, apparently this book was published like in 2021. I wonder if it was like because it says like it won a prize and I wonder if like it was submitted and like published for that prize and now it's getting like professionally published or something. Anyway, this is A Fig for All the Devils by C.S. Fritz. Um, this cover intrigued me. The title definitely intrigued me. Um, definitely since this is a new release, let me um, read you the premise. I mean, sometimes I try to talk about the premise myself, but sometimes I know that I will ramble for 20 minutes trying to badly describe what a book is about, and I'm better, and I'm better off just telling you what the professional said so that we're not here all day. Let's see. IBPA is Gold Award winner for Best in Horror 2021. 
An abused, grief-stricken, and impoverished Sonny has all but given up on life. That is, until he meets death by the way of the Grim Reaper. The Reaper, a junk food-loving, poetry-reading, cigarette-addicted entity, has no time to waste as he searches for a suitable successor who would become death for the next millennium. By training the boy in the ways of death and dying, Reaper grooms his young apprentice and through suspenseful and horror-laced events, he unknowingly gives Sonny something he never intended, a reason to live. I mean, suspenseful and horror-laced events... Eh. It was, it was very clunky execution. Like, and there were... I just, I keep thinking of... The moment when the Grim Reaper is explaining his succession of his role to Sonny and is like, I choose you, you're a good, you know, you're a good fit, I choose you, and this is what the process entails, and it's like this dark, serious conversation, and then somewhere in there, Sonny is like, oh, you mean like Legend of Zelda, and the, and the conversation just like comes to a screeching halt, and it's like, Oh yeah, I love Zelda. Which one have you played? Oh, I've played this one on, you know, the GameCube. Anyway, back to serious conversation. And it's just like, I see that you're trying to like add these like quirks to the Grim Reaper and make him like a fully fleshed out character and more than just the specter of the Grim Reaper. But like, it's really, really clunky. Um, again, like the tone just has... Like, the tone does not transition so much as, like, it gets chopped out and something else drops in for a few paragraphs and then we'll jump back out to something else. Here's one thing I said is, like, we needed more buildup of doubt. Like, is this person actually that cruel? Oh, okay, yes, I guess they will go that far. Um, like, something like, we need to, we, like... This is like the suspense that was missing is like with the cruelty that's inflicted mostly by his mother and um, his mother's new boyfriend. Um, we're kind of like told and shown immediately that they're really awful people. And I feel like the story would have been served better if we if that was if we eased into that, if we saw something that kind of made us doubt and be like, was that them? Were they actually doing that on purpose? Were they actually doing that because they're a fucking psychopath? Like, are they? And then like having it confirmed. I think having that confirmation of, oh yes, this person is beyond redemption. Oh yes, this person is willing to kill you. This person is willing to ruin your life. I think being like told that from the beginning is just like, it was just like awful horror, gross horror shock value, but it didn't really serve the suspense and horror of the length of the novel. Um, and it's like, and sometimes we are told you should be doubting something, but the text doesn't support it. Um, so there's moments where like Sonny starts to think that he's hallucinating. And it's like, it's like, well, your mother saw the thing that you now doubt is real. Like, you, there's textual evidence beyond your experience that supports that this thing did happen. So I, as the reader, am not, f am not drawn in by Sonny now questioning things. Because I, as the reader, know that there's evidence outside of his experience. So... Yeah, I thought the most interesting part was w that in order to become the Grim Reaper, there are these, like, three trials that the new person has to go through. Um, I thought that was probably the strongest part of this con the concept of this book, but we don't learn about that. We don't learn about that aspect until we're, like, halfway through. Um, and I feel like if the whole story had been more focused on the trials of becoming the Grim Reaper, of transitioning into being the Grim Reaper, I think this would have been a stronger story, but I think, like, we took too long to get there, and I wasn't convinced by the horror. Oh, and then at the end, Sonny and his mother kind of, like, make up, and, like, his mother is, like, he, there's, like, a forgiveness and, like, a repentance that, like, it just happens, and I'm like, I don't buy it. We're, like, we didn't have a proper build-up 
to this transition and this growth in these characters. So that, it, it was disappointing. Okay, next we have a romance novel. This is A Daring Pursuit. This is book two of The Ruthless Rivals by Kate Bateman. Last month I read A Reckless Match, which um, I really, really enjoyed. The, these are like enemy enemies to lovers, rivals to lovers, um, uh, historical romances. Um, this one was not as strong as the first book. And I think what happened, <clears throat> I was thinking about this just today. I think the distinction is... In the first book, the, the, the characters from these rival families, um, they don't realize that they like the other person. So their, you know, butting heads banter, we as the audience get to really see them, see how much they enjoy this, see how much they complement each other, how fulfilling they are for each other, how much they enjoy this. And we get to see that transition of them realize that, oh, this isn't actually hate this is something else um, and have them come into that realization and then have to figure out if the other person feels the same. In this one, each of the characters knowingly has attraction to the other person. It's just realizing that the other person feels the same way. Um, but I think because we, they go in already having that attraction, there's, there's just like something missing. There's, you know, there's a, a little bit less buildup and of course there's less banter. Like the first book is great, great, great teasing, jibe, jibing banter. Um, and the second book just didn't have that as much. It's like, I mean, it's still fun. You know, the steam, steamy scenes are still nice. We could have had some more. Like, yes, I am totally happy with lots of steamy scenes in my books. It's more that like, I felt that there were some plot moments that kind of called for some more of those scenes that just didn't happen. Oh, this was another book that had a marriage of convenience to a queer person. Um, and this is another one where, oh, sorry, this is the one that has the line of, well, I lived in Paris and it's actually quite common there, so I'm not like offended that this person's queer. And I appreciate that both parties go into it knowing what it is and potentially both of them gaining equally from it. Um, <clears throat> oh, I should tell you the, the premise of this, of um, how these characters get to be romantic. So it is, I don't remember exactly, it's like the sister of one family and then like the middle brother of another family. <clears throat> and the sister she is a very um, scandalous person and very flirtatious and, and wears like scandalous clothing. Now she ha is not a virgin. She had a romantic liaison several years ago that was very disappointing. And it kind of left her being like, why the fuck do people make a fuss about this? Oh my God, that's so disappointing. I would rather be in a sexless marriage than have to go through with that regularly with a straight husband. Um, so that's kind of her take on it, but she's like, everyone is making such a big deal about it, I can't talk to anyone about it. And somehow, through reasons, the other guy learns about this. And he's like, listen, if you really, really want to marry this queer guy, I mean, like, she and the queer guy are friends. They like each other, um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be an unhappy marriage. It would just be, you know, convenient. Um, it's what she thinks that she wants. It's what she thinks is the best option available to her. Um, she would love to not marry, but she she knows that she probably won't be able to escape that. So this is kind of her, her second best option. So the guy, like, learns that, like, this is her plan and this is, like, her experience. And he's like... I, oh my god, I can't let you get married with that being your only sexual experience. So they kind of enter into like a sexual relationship of convenience of him trying to prove to her that physical intimacy can be amazing if done right and her experience was just a one-off by an asshole. Um, so I do like the that part of that is kind of like a slow burn. She, like she goes to him and is like, all right, let's go. And he's like, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna just start with kissing. We're just gonna start with building that tension, building that anticipation. So it's a, 
I don't know if this is really going to count as a slow burn, but it like, they don't like jump into bed immediately um, for the purpose of when they do, it's more exciting. So I do really like, you know, so I did really like that aspect of um, the story. Um, I just felt that like, there was some, I just felt that it was just had a little something missing from it in comparison to the first book of the series. And then the last book I finished um, was the audiobook for The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. This is another book that uh, was pulled off of my Amnesia Reads TBR. Um, so I, uh, in high school, we read East of Eden. And like to this day, that has remained one of my favorite. Oh, that's probably not historical fiction. That was probably contemporary fiction at the time that it was written. But it remains one of my, like, literary classics, modern classics, you know, straight up fiction books. Um, the themes of, like, good and evil and, like, the nature versus nurture and, in, like, is man inherently good or inherently evil? I felt like the way that story portrayed that conversation was very interesting. I loved it. Um, so I read this and then I promptly forgot everything about it. <laughs> Um, so I read this again, mostly listening to the audiobook, and oh my god, it made me so fucking mad. In in a in a good way, in in a successful way, in a successful way, um, because there is so much in this book that is still so starkly relevant to today and it just makes me so fucking frustrated and angry and exhausted. So this is the premise of the Jode family during the Great Depression. Um, they are one of the families that um, travels to California during the Great Depression looking for work. Um, and before they leave there's a whole conversation. I, I accidentally returned my audiobook before I went back and put in my tabs and I'm so mad and I actually got back in line to reborrow the audiobook hoping that my tabs were saved because um, if you hate capitalism this book will speak to your soul and also make you cry because capitalism has never fucking worked. It's never fucking worked. And this is <laughs> a snapshot into, <laughs> like, you want to know how capitalism works, how it functions? It functions by exploiting and destroying the people at the bottom. So um, we have the chapters of the Joad family, and in between there's, like, these vignettes that talk about, you know, not necessarily any one character in particular. It's kind of talking about a concept, a common occurrence. Like, there's a story of, like, um, families buying cars. There's like conversations that are happening at a used car lot. There's a very early conversation about um, <clears throat> like a farmer has lost the, their land. They've lost the lease on the land and now there's a guy in a tractor who's like I am instructed to plow the fields and I'm instructed to plow the fields in a straight line and that means I'm going to run right through your house. If you are in your house I will drive the tractor over your body because that is what I am instructed to do and that's what I'm paid to do, you know. Um, and just saying, like, blame the banks, blame the bank. Like, this is what the... And there's another conversation of, like, I don't know if it's in that same scene, but it's kind of like, like, this is my family, this is my home. Like, who do I talk to? And it's like, I don't know, talk to the banks. Well, the, well, the, the bank is not a person. Like, where is the person I can talk to? Those banks must be owned by somebody. I guess someone in New York. Like, like, who is the human being making the decision to starve and kill my family? Like, who, who can I go plead my fucking life to? And it's like, because of the, you know, the, um, the transition of small farmers to like big agriculture as owned by the the bank you know in in this book it's not um the corporations it's not capitalism it's the banks the banks are kind of like the big nebulous thing that has replaced actual human beings making decisions <clears throat> but like the conversations are the same the conversations are the same of like 
suddenly the, the, the entities that hold the power, that hold the power over workers, over production, over consumerism are so big that like the people making those decisions are so insulated that like there's no repercussions for the decisions they make because they're so unreachable. They're so big and so insulated. <sighs> anyway, they travel to California and they find out that like this promise of work is a fucking lie. It's a fucking lie. Um, they need 500 workers. So they print 2000 pamphlets. And when there's 2000 workers competing for 500 spots, they can pay you 10 cents a day. They don't have to pay you the $2 you promised. They can pay you 50 cents. Because if you don't take it, there's a hundred men behind you willing to, willing to step up and say yes. There's a, and you know, that manufactured scarcity in order to force desperate people to make desperate decisions. And it's a very calculated manufactured situation. And that, still happens today because they know if they keep people hungry and searching and restless and unfilled then they can't organize and fight back and there's a bunch you know i'm sure at the time this book was probably labeled like pro-socialist propaganda which yeah probably fucking is um fuck it i agree with it the workers should control the means of production because when they don't the bank, will, the bank will drive over the bodies of your children in your house and not give a shit. <clears throat> it makes me want to burn all the things down. <sighs> it's not a happy book. It's a very frustrating book. But, um, I, but, uh, okay, but did I like the book? I mean, I like is a hard word, but... Do I see the hype of why this is such a memorable classic of, like, I do really like John Steinbeck's writing. Um, I like how he presents these moral quandaries. I like how he depicts these characters. I really, really like the mother character in this book. Um, uh, oh, I do want to say, like, there is some outdated racist language that's very of its time. Interestingly, I know in contrast to Under the Black Flag, it doesn't bother me. Like, I just still kind of read it and flinch a little bit because I'm like, it's not language I want to hear coming out of anyone's mouth today. The language is of its time, but it's not really commenting on the ideas behind the language. So while it's not... Um, criticizing that language it's also like not necessarily trying to reinforce it it's just the language of the time so I know there's some readers who are very very sensitive to you know a book by a white author that has the n-word or has you know certain other racial slurs in it that's fine you know I say that because like there's some people who just don't want to put up with it okay I'm very warm, my voice is tired, I'm hungry, and that's the video. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will have my social media and other places where you can find me linked in the description box below, and I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye! Here, my hair is a little bit damp, and as it dries it starts to say fuck you to gravity in unexpected ways. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. <laughs> How do I explain this? Have I already explained it? Maybe. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Piff.